Welcome to Earth. Independence Day is an epic science fiction action movie directed by Roland Emmerich and written by himself and Dean Devlin. With an all-star cast, this movie is considered a turning point in the history of the summer blockbuster film. Starting on the morning of July 2nd, an extraterrestrial alien mothership some 340 miles in diameter enters Earth's orbit, causing satellite disruption around the world. At the Pentagon, Marine Corps General William Gray, played by actor Robert Loggia, is informed about the object and alerts the White House. Get me the Secretary of Defense. Then wake him! The President of the United States, Thomas J. Whitmore, played by Bill Pullman, is a former Gulf War fighter pilot, husband to First Lady Marilyn Whitmore, played by Mary McDonnell, and father to young daughter Patricia, played by Mae Whitman. I have a confession to make. I'm sleeping next to a beautiful young brunette. You didn't let her stay up all night watching TV. Did you? Plagued down by crippling low approval ratings, President Whitmore appears to be a lame duck with little chance for re-election. Autant, leadership as a pilot in the Gulf War is completely different from leadership in politics. That's the problem. They elected a warrior and they got a wimp. The First Lady is out of town in Los Angeles attending a political event, hoping to boost her husband's dismal standing with the American public. The president also gets political advice from White House Communications Director Constance Spano, played by actress Margaret Collin. They're not attacking your policies, they're attacking your age. Whitmore seems less like the president and more like the orphan child Oliver asking, please sir, I'd like some more. Isn't it amazing how quickly everyone can turn against you? In New York City, David Levinson, played by actor Jeff Goldblum, is Constance's ex-husband of the last three years, an MIT graduate turned satellite engineer for a cable TV company, and he is informed by his co-worker Marty, played by Harvey Firestein, that their entire cable company, as well as every other one, is blurry and fuzzy because of the bad satellites. Try to switch transponder channels? Oh, please, you think I'd be this panicked if it was something simple? Okay, let's point the dish at another satellite. It didn't work. It's almost as though they weren't even there. It's impossible. Near Irvine, California, Russell Case, played by Randy Quaid, is a crop duster pilot and retired Vietnam combat pilot who's now an alcoholic and a single stepfather. He claims he was abducted by aliens ten years before and that they've been studying humans and preparing to attack. Soon, the mothership deploys several dozen saucer-shaped spacecraft, each around 15 miles across. They begin to position themselves over several major cities around the world. In the United States, they position themselves over New York, Washington, and Los Angeles. President, I strongly recommend we move you to a secure location immediately. County, can we expect the same kind of panic we saw in Russia? More than likely. Mr. President, we can discuss this on the way. I'm not leaving. Yes, sir. We'll initiate the emergency broadcast system. We'll advise people not to panic. The best idea right now is to stay in their homes. The president decides against ordering mandatory evacuations of the cities and decides to stay at the White House and attempt some contact or communication with the spacecraft. And what happens if they do become hostile? And God help us. In New York, David soon realizes that the aliens are using a signal within our own satellite system as a synchronized countdown to zero. They're positioning themselves all over the world, using this one signal to synchronize their efforts in approximately six hours. The signal's going to disappear and the countdown's going to be over. And then what? Checkmate. Fearing an attack may be imminent, he tries to persuade his ex-wife Constance to leave Washington and to alert the president. Uh, you gotta leave the White House. It's not like the time or the place to be having that same old discussion. You don't understand, you gotta leave Washington. You are just being paranoid. It's not paranoia. The embedding's very subtle. It's probably been overlooked. If... With no other option, David gets his father, Julius, played by actor Judd Hirsch, to drive him from New York 
to Washington, D.C. You still have the Plymouth? You want to borrow the car? David, you don't have a license. You're driving. Yeah, I'm I'm driving. Come Come on, come on. In Los Angeles, U.S. Marine Captain Stephen Hiller, played by Will Smith, and his unit, the Black Knights Fighter Squadron, are called back from 4th of July leave to their base at Marine Corps Air Station El Toro. I really don't think they flew 90 billion light years to come down here and start a fight and get all rowdy. He invites his girlfriend Jasmine Dubrow, played by Vivica Fox, and her young son Dylan to join him on the base. Why don't you get some things packed and you and Dylan come stay with me on the base. You will see that there is nothing to be scared of. Really? David and Julius arrive at the White House and Connie agrees to allow them a brief moment with the president. You know what famous people have been here? Hmm? Hmm? Politicians, actors, baseball players, singers, and now me. Imagine that. Look, a poor immigrant like me. It's a dream. Shh, David, please. <laughs> David had a contentious relationship with the president as Connie ended their marriage for the sake of her career. After speaking with David, the president soon realizes that an attack may be imminent and declares mass evacuations of the major cities underneath the alien spacecraft. General Gray, coordinate with the Atlantic Command. Tell them to evacuate as many people out of the cities as they can. Yes, sir. This is substantiated further when the alien ships kill helicopter pilots attempting to communicate with the spacecraft. We are evacuating. I repeat, we are evacuating the White House. The president's order of the evacuation, we have to leave now. Authorities have called for a complete evacuation of Los Angeles County. People are advised to avoid the highways wherever possible. Oh yeah, great. Now he tells me. As mass evacuations are ordered and the president boards Air Force One, the alien spaceships simultaneously attack. Time's up. Destroying much of New York, Washington, and Los Angeles. Reports are unclear as the extent of the devastation, but from all accounts, Los Angeles, Washington, and New York have been left in ruins. Good Although several God! Lines make confirmation I've been saying it. it is believed I've been saying it for ten damn years. By July 3rd, President Whitmore aboard Air Force One is informed that his wife is missing near Los Angeles and that millions of Americans have been killed. We could have evacuated the cities hours ago. A lot of people died today. How many didn't have to? Following the attacks on New York, Washington, and Los Angeles, the United States quickly begins a counterattack against the three 15-mile-wide spaceships leaving those destroyed cities. Los Angeles Attack Squadron has AMRAM missiles locked on target. Washington New York Squadron is reporting lock on. Fire at will. Fire at will. All right, Will. Among those participating in the assault is Captain Hiller, taking off from El Toro to attack the ship that destroyed Los Angeles. Night one, Fox three. Night three, Fox three. Night seven, Fox three. Are they not getting through? No, sir, not one. After it becomes apparent that the U.S. missiles are unable to penetrate the defensive shields of the spacecraft, scores of smaller attacker ships are released from the spaceship and soon begin attacking U.S. pilots as well as military installations. Captain Hiller manages to evade an attacker and winds up in the Mojave Desert, capturing a downed alien craft. That's what I call a close encounter. Aboard Air Force One, the president is pressured by his staff to launch a full nuclear strike against the ships hovering over the United States. Hearing this, David and Julius decide to speak out. We must launch. A delay now would be more costly than when you waited to evacuate the cities. No, no, you're not going to launch nuclear weapons. Shut up, Captain, get him out of here! Hey, hey, don't tell him to shut up! Come on, Julius. It was what, in the 1950s or whatever, you you had that uh, spaceship? Area 51! You know then! All characters begin to converge on Area 51 in Nevada. You need a lift, soldier? When I flew overhead, I saw a base not too far from here. It ain't on a map. Trust me, it's there. 
where it is revealed that the U.S. government has been in possession of a crashed alien spaceship since 1947. While there, General Gray informs the president that a second wave attack has occurred, destroying Chicago, Atlanta, and Philadelphia. We're being exterminated. After Captain Hiller hitches a ride with Russell Case to Area 51 and gains access with the captured alien, President Whitmore attempts to communicate with the alien, asking if there is a possibility of some kind of diplomatic truce. Can there be a peace between us? With no other options, the president decides to use nuclear weapons against the hovering spacecraft. Which city will be reached first? Uh, Houston, Texas. ETA, six minutes and counting down. Houston. The major cities have been deserted. Civilian casualties should be down to a minimum. After Houston, Texas is destroyed, but the spaceship hovering above remains untouched, the situation becomes futile as the characters band together to come up with one last hope to try and take down the aliens before it's too late. Now, the idea of this film began in 1994 when Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin were in Europe promoting the movie Stargate. A reporter asked Emmerich why he'd make a movie about aliens if he didn't believe in them. Emmerich responded by saying that he was fascinated by the idea of an alien arrival and asked the reporter, just imagine what it would be like to wake up one morning to discover 15-mile-wide spaceships hovering over the world's biggest cities. Emmerich then turned to Devlin and said, Hey, I think I have an idea for our next film. Roland Emmerich also said that he noticed most alien movies always had the spaceships or the aliens trying to hide or not make their presence known. He thought it would be interesting to have a scenario where aliens wanted to be seen in the biggest way on their arrival. And what if they didn't come in peace, but they were here to fucking kill us? Emmerich and Devlin wrote the script during a month-long vacation in Mexico, and just one day after they sent it out for consideration, 20th Century Fox gave the green light. Three days later, pre-production began in February of 1995. The original title of the movie was Doomsday. The U.S. military originally intended on providing personnel, vehicles, and costumes for the film, but they backed out when they learned that the script made references to Area 51. The U.S. government would not publicly acknowledge Area 51's existence until the year 2013. For the character of Captain Stephen Hiller, Will Smith was always the first choice, but Eddie Murphy was the immediate backup, and Dean Devlin expected that Murphy's star power would end up getting him cast in the role. Ethan Hawke, Tom Cruise, Johnny Depp, Keanu Reeves, Jean-Claude Van Damme, and William Baldwin were all considered for the role of Captain Stephen Hiller. Despite having top billing, Will Smith does not appear on screen until 20 minutes into the movie. This film was released just weeks after the series finale of Smith's NBC hit television series The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which had aired from 1990 until May of 1996. Ross Bagley, who plays Dylan, appeared as Will Smith's cousin Nicky on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. The success of this movie, along with his 1995 action hit Bad Boys, would launch Will Smith into mega superstardom. Smith's then-girlfriend Jada Pinkett was offered the role of Jasmine, but she had already accepted a role in the movie The Nutty Professor and was unavailable. The role then went to actress Vivica A. Fox. The character of the President of the United States was originally supposed to be more of a gruff Richard Nixon type of leader. The role was written this way and was specifically tailored for actor Kevin Spacey. However, the studio felt that Kevin Spacey, who had yet to achieve his mega success in movies like L.A. Confidential and American Beauty, did not have enough star power for the role. Bill Pullman was cast and the role was written to be a younger and less Nixonian type of president. President Whitmore is described as a former jet fighter pilot from the Gulf War, and he flies his own plane in the final attack on the aliens. 
This may have been a quiet tribute to President George H.W. Bush, who was a naval aviator in the U.S. Navy during World War II. Bush flew multiple combat missions in the Pacific theater of the war and was once rescued by a U.S. submarine after his plane was shot down by enemy fire. We will not vanish without a fight. We're going to live on. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. The memorable and iconic speech that the president gives in the movie was filmed on August 6th, 1995, in front of an old airplane hangar that once housed the Enola Gay, which dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima exactly 50 years to the day earlier, on August 6th, 1945. For the role of David Levinson, Matthew Broderick was considered, but he was unavailable. The role then went to actor Jeff Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum's character predicts disaster, just as he did in Jurassic Park from 1993. And he also repeats a memorable line that he said in Jurassic Park. Faster. Must go faster. Must go faster. Must go faster. Roland Emmerich wanted actor Martin Landau for the role of Julius Levinson, but he was busy with another project. The part went to actor Judd Hirsch. I don't understand. Where does all this come from? How do you get funding for something like this? Well, you don't actually think they spend $20,000 on a hammer, $30,000 on a toilet seat, do you? Hirsch and Goldblum were only 17 years apart in age, despite playing father and son. Actress Allie Walker was cast in the role as Constance Spano, but she suddenly became unavailable at the last minute. There was a rush to find a new actress for the role. Then 37-year-old actress Margaret Collin jokingly told an inexperienced casting assistant that she was only 22 years old. The assistant assumed she was telling the truth and told the producers that she was too young and unavailable for the part. Eventually the confusion was cleared up and Margaret Collin landed the role. Even though she might not be instantly recognized by name, Margaret Collin has had the privilege of starring in two of the most colossal hit films of the 1980s and 1990s. Three Men and a Baby, which was the biggest movie in the world in 1987, and Independence Day, which was the biggest movie in the world in 1996. I think she's wonderful in this role. She has great chemistry with Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, still believe it. Well, he's a good man. Well, <laughs> he better be. You left me for him. Or, you know, for your career. And if I'm being honest, I actually find her quite attractive. I love her on-screen presence. And she brings a lot to the movie. Haven't you ever wanted to be part of something special? I was part of something special. Mary McDonnell accepted her role as the First Lady immediately after her agent pitched the movie by saying, it's about 15 mile wide spaceships. Robert Loggia became upset during production because Dean Devlin accidentally suggested that Loggia watch the movie Airplane for inspiration about his role in the film. He had intended to suggest the movie Airport. Not familiar with either film, Loja rented Airplane, and he got upset thinking that he was making a spoof movie instead of a serious film about an alien attack. Eventually, it was all cleared up. Since it was never established in the script, Robert Loja got to decide which branch of the U.S. military his character would be in. He chose the Marine Corps. Loja wanted his character to be reminiscent of famous generals in American history, including... General Norman Schwarzkopf, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Patton, and MacArthur. Well, General Grace is the most recent uh, war that we've been involved in. Is the Gulf War is very much General Schwarzkopf yeah. kind of fellow, and I patterned the role very much after the general. Mm -hmm. I admired him very much his deportment during the war, which was that he was a soldier and not a politician, and he didn't mix politics with with his his. Uh, his call to duty in, in terms of d defending the country and winning. Harvey Firestein and Lisa Jacob both previously appeared in the 1993 movie Mrs. Doubtfire, which was another colossal hit of the 1990s. Actresses Diane Bellamy, Judith Hogue, and Jessica Tuck were all cast in large roles that were ultimately not included in the final script. The anticipation for this movie was insane. 
the hype was ridiculous. The advertising campaign cost $24 million. The airtime for the trailer shown during Super Bowl 30 cost $1.3 million. The day before its nationwide release, it was screened at the White House for President Bill Clinton with Roland Emmerich and Bill Pullman in attendance. Upon its release 4th of July week 1996, it grossed an astounding amount of money. Worldwide, it grossed $817 million, making it, at the time, the second highest grossing movie in history, only after 1993's Jurassic Park, which also starred Jeff Goldblum. Much like Jaws in 1975, Independence Day started a chain reaction that began a major resurgence of disaster and science fiction type movies, with large casts, big budgets, and summer releases. Films like Volcano, Dante's Peak, Titanic, Deep Impact, Armageddon, all would be released in the two years following this movie. I remember when this came out in 1996, and I also remember that in the 1990s, there was a lot of alien stuff. We were at the 50th anniversary of Roswell, you had television shows like The X-Files, the television show Roswell, movies like Independence Day, Men in Black, just a lot of alien stuff in the 1990s. This movie was a really, really big deal in the 1990s, and it is a really, really fantastic film. I highly recommend Independence Day.